Fireside Chat, episode 25. Doing our civic duty. Recorded October 21st, 2013. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. Another episode of Fireside Chat, and this is Dan and Matt coming to you from Calgary Civic Election Night. And the night where the Flames are on the road playing the Kings in the last game of their uh, California sweep. How you doing, Matt? Very good. Did you vote today, Dan? I sure did. I went out and did my civic duty. And what about you? Did you do your civic duty? Uh, no, unfortunately. I was busy all day with the uh, cabinet installer, so couldn't actually get out in time. All right, well, we'll, we'll let you get off the hook for this one. So last week was a fairly uh, short week for the Flames. They only had two games, and they were fr- pretty evenly spaced out. They had a Wednesday and a Saturday game, um, both, a cal- both part of their California road trip. And even though they didn't come away with any points so far on this road trip, I thought that they looked pretty good. What did you think? Yeah, the effort was definitely there. Just some bad bounces, weird deflection goals, you know, things that you can't really help too much. You know, and we were playing two teams that are vastly superior talent-wise, and we were in it the entire game. And for large portions, we actually controlled the game, so... That's pretty much all you can hope for with a team that's in our current situation. I don't know what it is about the Honda Center, but the Flames just can't win there. I mean, it's been since 2004 since we've had a win in that building. So I don't know if the Ducks have just always had a good team since then. I guess, thinking back, they probably have. But it's frustrating that we have a building that gives us that much trouble. Well, like, even then, like, we only won the one time, and that you have to go back to, like, 99 when we won the previous time before that. Like... It's just one of those weird things that, you know, like in the NHL, we have the worst streak going of any team in any building. So it's cursed for us. I didn't get to see the San Jose game. Um, I was out for dinner. I was at a conference in Anaheim that week. Maybe you can talk about that one, but I'll just give you some thoughts from what I saw being at the Honda Center for the uh, Anaheim game. I thought the team came out and looked pretty good. I thought they had a lot of energy. They played well. I really liked their pa- their uh, power play and their penalty kill. They killed off a lot of penalties. They even scored shorthanded on the five-minute major. Uh, the special teams were looking really good. The only, I guess, issue I had was that Monaghan looked a little bit uneasy at the start of the game, and he didn't look like the player that we've seen so far out of him. So I was a bit worried about that. But by the end of the game, I thought that he turned around and started looking like uh, like himself, the usual Monaghan that we've seen. Matt, do you think that maybe that's a sign that this guy is a pro and if he can take his game and change it halfway through, he's ready for the NHL? Yeah. it It's one of those things that people have to remember, even though he has such good vision on the ice, that he is only nine, just turned 19. And, you know... Any rookie and young player is going to have a bad game here and there or bad few shifts. It's encouraging, though, that he was able to respond to his lackluster play and perform better. Like, if you, it, during the San Jose game, like, TJ Brody had an absolutely dreadful game. You know, that's to be expected, though. You know, that's the nature of being a rebuilding team, is that the young players are going to struggle. It, the important thing, though, is that they learn from the mistakes that they do make in order to head those problems off at the pass and not, you know, have that problem repeat all the time over and over and over again. This year is a rebuilding team. I think it's unwise and even unfair for fans to be expecting a lot of wins out of this team, but I think what the fans can expect and reasonably should expect is a good effort every night. This team has to come out and play their game. They got to go out, they got to play a hard hitting game, they have to play a high energy game, and they have to give it their all every night. Do you agree? Oh, definitely. And even though they lost 6 3 to San Jose, the effort level was still there. And other than like the first five or 10 minutes, like they were actually keeping pace 
with San Jose despite the scoreline. And uh, like after two periods, it was four to one, and yet the play was relatively even. So like it wasn't surprising that they got back in it later in the game. So you know they just have to keep giving that good effort and outworking their opponents. You know, like, they're not going to necessarily get wins every night, but in terms of the rebuild, an effort like that is a win because they're the players themselves are forming good habits on this is what I need to do to succeed. And, like, once we get the good supporting cast players, whether that's guys that are coming up like Goudreau, Poirier, and Klimchuk, or, you know, players that have to be acquired through trade... You know, that's yet to be determined, but as long as the kids are getting the good fundamentals of their game set, then, you know, a year or two years down the road, that'll be nothing but good for, like, once we're actually coming out of the rebuild process. Yeah, and Anaheim was a similar um, type of game to what you're talking about in San Jose. I thought the team played okay in the first period. But it was really coming back in the second period that they played their best game um, after that break between the periods. But, yeah, I agree with you. If we can set a work ethic for this team, if the young guys and even the veterans that are here now can set a work ethic and say, this is what it means to be a Calgary Flame. This is the type of effort you have to put in. This is the hard work you have to put in. And if you can't do this, we don't want you here. And coaches and management are agreeing to that. I think, like you said, it's going to it's gonna set a, a precedent for everybody else. And it's going to make it so that everybody knows if you're coming to Calgary, you're going to have to work hard. And this is what's going to be expected of you right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And plus, uh, to your earlier point, like Monaghan did struggle in Anaheim, but yet in San Jose, he was the best Flames forward on the ice. So like that too is a good sign that like he's able to bounce back after having a poorer game to, you know, having a goal and an assist and you know, looking dangerous every time that he had the puck in the offensive zone. You know, it's... Monaghan's really impressive. Yeah. Well, anytime you're in the top 30 in points and you're 19, you're, you're doing something right. But, you know... Well, not only being 19, being in your first season. I mean, it's possible being 19, you could have played a season before this, but... Do you think he'll stay past 10 games? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, you, you can't... It would... <sighs> be a little bit of a slap to the face of the him and like any of the other young players because like he has been either the best or one of the top three forwards on the team this season so you know like to get rid of him just because oh we don't want to burn his contract like give me a break like you can see that... You piss off a good portion of your fan base, too. Yeah, and realistically, it, he, uh, down the road, like, once his contract is up, he's going to be likely a 5 or $6 million guy. So it's not really going to make any difference whether he's on his entry-level contract or not. Like, it's not like we're going to be rebuilding for five years where, you know... <laughs> You need to worry about such you things. You have to hope we won't be rebuilding for five years. If we are, we've done something horribly wrong in this whole process. Yeah. Then we're Edmonton, and that's never good. Nobody wants to be Edmonton. I do everything in life I can to strive to be unlike Edmonton. Don't we all? <laughs> so, Matt, I guess the other Flames news, as far as Flames that were looking good and Flames that um, perhaps weren't, uh, Kerry Ramo, he played in the San Jose game. What did you think of his performance there? The best performance where a goalie gave up five goals. <laughs> like, seriously, three of the goals were deflected shots, which they either hit you, they go in, or they miss the net. And unfortunately, three of them found their target. Like, the reaction time that one would have is very minimal, especially when the tip is, like, right in front of you. Like, you know, there's nothing you can do. And the other two goals was Brent Burns being 10 feet in front of the goalie, which, give me a break, that, you know, you have anybody 10 feet in front of you wanting to shoot on you, that puck's likely going in. And the other one was Marlowe off to the side of the net where Camilleri usually scores. Like, he didn't have any chance on any of the goals. 
in my opinion. But, like, all the rest of the saves that he made, like, they were credible saves, and he did stop a penalty shot and a breakaway and a few other, you know, really nice-looking saves. One difference I noticed with his play is that in the preseason and that, like, he was unsettled with his movements. Like, he'd be overcommitting when he would be moving side to side or, like, when he'd be going to block a shot or something. Like, it, it just... It didn't look right because it, you know, like usually when you see goalies, it's very controlled and defined, but it was not in the preseason with him. But last night he was very controlled in his actions, which if he continues with being centered like that, he could develop into a quality lower tier starting goaltender. It just depends. But... I, I didn't see that game, but from what I saw of clips, yeah, he looked pretty good. It looked like, I think, Ramo's best outing, not just with the Flames, but the best outing I've seen from him in North America, even in his brief time in the NHL and the AHL in the past. Um, if you were the coach and you were picking a goalie for tonight and, I guess, going forward, do you still pick McDonald over Ramo? Uh, tonight, I would put Ramo in, which, you yeah, know, the game as of this recording starts in about five minutes so we'll see but you know it, his performance like if you just looked at the stats you go oh wow he gave up five goals and like that's terrible but if you actually watch the game there's you only so leaky sieve like uh, McElhane. yeah like there's only so much you can do and, like, when you're giving up chances like they were, like, at times, like, you know, there's only so much a guy can do. <laughs> so. Well, that's it. There's, there's five guys in front of him, and all those five guys have to be doing their job as well for the goaltender to look mm -hmm. good. And I think we as Calgary fans are a bit spoiled in that way because we've had Kippersoff here for so many years who could single-handedly win the team a game if he needed to. Yeah, well, with how they played last night, I, or against San Jose, like, even if Kipper was in his prime, I still think he would have gave up four or five of those goals. So, you know, it... You can't really fault Ramo for that. And, you know, usually I'm critical of goalies for when they make mistakes and that, but, you know, you, you can't blame him for that. So I'd give him another shot, and if he like really struggles bad tonight or tomorrow then go with mac again and you know just keep turning it over if one has a bad performance go to the other and just kind of switch back and forth so between those two you think even though they both lost ramo earned the right to play again in the first of the two games in the back-to-back -back series then you play mcdonald in uh, phoenix and you see which one of them played better to put in the net against Dallas? Yeah, that's how I'd play it. Makes sense. I think I'd probably do the same. And, you know, we talked about this before, but if Ramos just not cutting it, they can always go to the farm and pull uh, Barra up as well. Yeah. Well, speaking of Barra, he uh, had a poor game two games ago against uh, Oklahoma City. And, like, he gave up four goals and he got yanked. But then the next night, he was actually the first star of the game and bounced back with a really good performance, only giving up one goal. So that's also encouraging that, you know, uh, you know, any time a goalie can bounce back from a bad game, it's a good thing. For sure, and especially a young goaltender, because to be able to learn that, I'd say it's, I mean, you're the goalie, I'm not, but I'd say to be able to learn that poise and confidence to be able to do that at a young age is really important to a goalie's development. Yeah, you need to have a really short memory, otherwise it, it can screw with your head. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, we've seen goaltenders in the past who seem to take that harder than perhaps they should and let it affect them more, and it you can tell that it affects their whole career. So if you can have that short memory and you can get over it, brush it off, and move on, I think you're going to make a better goaltender in the long run. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, the other good news, I guess, for the Flames as far as players playing in the lineup, um, we talked about Ramo, who got a shot, and the other guy who's getting a shot this week is Camilleri. He'll be, he's expected to be back in the lineup this week, 
Um, and that's, I mean, Camilleri is one of the biggest names on this team, no matter how you look at it. Where do you think he slots in, and who do you think he should be playing with? Well, ideally, I would actually put him either with Berchi and Monaghan or with Backland plus somebody else. You know, I think that uh, he could be better used as like a sort of a teacher for one of the younger lines, whomever that is. You know, his he's a very skilled guy, so you know, like he can be very helpful for guys like Monahan or Backland with you know getting. Because he knows where he needs to be to score, so like it will help whomever he plays with be able to go. Oh well, that's where I need to put the puck in order to, you know, on a usual basis. Because if you're relying on your line mates being good, then they should be going there. So looking more for plays of like how they develop properly, and you know. Camilleri will facilitate that better, so I think having him with the young players would be more beneficial in terms of the rebuild. But, you know, who knows? He might line up with Glenn Cross and Stempniak just because, you know. <laughs> Personally, I'd play him with the kids, though. Yeah, I guess that's all, all a matter of where they want to slot him in. Um, we know that he's a left winger, but the website lists him as a center. So it depends where they want to try and put him. I know they tried to convert him to center last year. You could do easily Camilleri on the left, Backlund at center, and Barchi on the right. Yeah, well, I've also seen Camilleri play right wing at times. So, you know, like you can pretty much put him wherever you want. Like, I don't think it really matters too much because usually he goes to the right side anyway, like when he's on the power play. So, you know, it just depends. You know, on the fit, whose line mates are going to be and all that. It, you know. Yeah, I guess it depends too how much the coach wants to shuffle his lines to put Camilleri in. I mean, he might just slot him into a line that's already existing or he might totally change the lines in order to get Camilleri in there too. Yeah, well, like, if you look at uh, the chemistry that Monaghan's uh, Berchi and Hoodler have, do you really want to break that up? You know, like, Hoodler has, po you know, like, Hoodler has points in every game. Monaghan, you know, he has eight points in seven games. Like, you know, that's why, like, having him with Backlund might not be a, a bad idea, because, you know, he's been okay because the, the backland line right now is what? Glenn Cross, Backlund, Galliardi? Something like that. It, th that line, those lines have been shuffled quite a bit, so, you know, it's a game to game thing. Yeah, because I wouldn't mind a line of Backlund, Galliardi, Camilleri. I could see that working, and then do Glenn Cross, Colburn, Stempniak for the second or third line, depending on how you want to look yeah. at it. That'd probably be a better breakdown. Yeah, that's probably what I'd do, at least at first. I think um, Camilleri, I mean, Galliardi's looked really good. I think that Camilleri should be on a line with one of the young guys, but I think if you could get, say, Camilleri, Backlund, Galliardi, so you kind of have a sandwich of two veterans with Backlund. I mean, Backlund's, I guess, a vet now, too, but you know what I mean. Um, that would probably be a better place to put him, because I'm just looking at the lines we've got. You're not going to put him on the fourth line, the McGratton line. I wouldn't break up the Barchi line, like you said, so you either go kind of, I think... Camilleri, assuming we put Camilleri on the left side, I don't want Camilleri playing with Colburn and Stempniak, so I'd probably do Camilleri, Backland, Galliardi. Yeah. Makes sense. And, you know, the nice thing there, too, is he can take the face-offs, I guess, if they want to move him to center. Um, he and Backland could switch the center and the wing if needed, or they could move, say, Camilleri to center on the special teams. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that having so many good secondary pieces that you can easily interchange various groups of players in amongst each other if a certain group isn't working properly. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that you have to kind of play it by ear to see how the players respond to him and how he responds to those players, whomever he's with. And, you know, make adjustments from there. 
Yeah, I think the only line I wouldn't touch is Berchi Monahan Hoodler, and everything else would be up for negotiation yeah. and up for looking at putting them somewhere else. Yeah. Until those guys start struggling together, keep them together. Yeah, and even when they start struggling, if I was the coach, and this is probably why I'm not paid as an NHL coach, but I'd probably still keep Berchi Monahan together oh, and yeah. try a different veteran on the way, yeah. maybe Stempniak or Galliardi. Most definitely. Or even Camilleri on the right side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, especially, like, if you're looking, like, next year and beyond, like, if Monaghan and Berchi have, like, that insanely good chemistry, like, that's, like, 90% of the problem, you know, like, <laughs> we've seen, like, how many times... Yeah, you just gotta find guys with chemistry. Yeah, like, how many times did we see Aginla get paired up with random players that he just didn't jive at all with? And, you know, like, everybody struggled at times, you know. So, if they have that chemistry working, then, like, by all means, keep them together no matter what. Well, it's funny you mention again, like, because I was thinking the same thing. I mean, as Flames fans, that was kind of the mantra for years was we have to find somebody Iggy can play with. And it almost seemed like, you know, the idea was just go out and sign anybody, put them on the ice, try it. If it doesn't work, get rid of them and bring somebody else in. But yeah, when you can home grow that um, chemistry, and when it's two guys that I think we could both agree are going to be flames for a long time, and Berchi and Monahan, that's what you really want to see, because you know that if they get good chemistry together, they'll play probably well together for a long time in the Flames jersey. Yeah, exactly. And realistically, that's the, what you need in a rebuild, is forming those bonds, whether, you know, it's a good defense pairing or whatever like it, as long as you start formulating those little things then it expands outwards from there so yeah it's encouraging yeah it definitely is and you know you're talking about the bonds and we've talked about this in the past but I really like the way the team is uh, spending time outside the rink together, the things that they're doing, the team building exercises that they're doing together. And I think that's really helping the bond this year too, of guys doing things outside the rink, besides just going for dinner with their line mates and their teammates. Well, it's a lot better if like, you're, you've are you got a bunch of people that are friends on the team. Because like, when the chips are down on the ice, like you're going to be standing up for your teammates instead of oh it's that goof and I don't want to talk to him you know like I'm not going to stand up for him because he's a goof you know what I mean like it it the more camaraderie well I think if the guys are teammates too it, it also helps when it comes to re-signing players I mean if you're friends with a lot of guys in the team I would imagine that player who has a contract that's up for negotiation might be more likely to come back for less money because they want to keep playing with all their friends. True. Nothing but positives. Not that we necessarily need the cap break right now. Oh, no. Like, we're so in the clear cap-wise, like, that's not even a consideration. As long as we're... But again, as long as we're... Three years down yeah. the road and you're trying to sign some of these guys. Yeah, well, as long as we're above the floor for the time being, it's all good. <laughs> And there's still no end in sight for Stajan's injury, right? He's on the shelf as far as we can tell for the for a while. Yeah. Well, uh, the bruise that he had, I actually had a similar one when I was playing soccer. It, it took quite a while for it to heal up properly, so I can well imagine that he'll be off for another couple of weeks at the very minimum. <laughs> Yeah, okay. those are not fun. That sucks. Yeah, but... they're just not fun because <laughs> like it's very hard to do anything physical when you have a bruise like that. So yeah, it's just a wait and see. Like it, you know, the body heals when it does, and he'll be back. <laughs> Oh, I know. Yeah, I know he'll be back, and that'll be probably our next discussion about changing the lines as well and seeing what are the Flames going to do to accommodate him. Mm. Send Jackman away. <laughs> Another, that that would probably be your, your best bet, Jackman or um, whoever the extra forward is. And speaking of lineup changes, um, the Flames made a lineup change today in sending 
uh, Jones and Smith down to the AHL and in return brought up Breen and Horak. Yeah, that's Blair Jones, um, not and, David Jones. Just oh, for right, clarification. Blair, yeah, Blair Jones, not David Jones. Yeah. Too many Joneses. So do you think this is a good move? Bringing, I mean, we know that Breen was left on the roster here at the start of the season, so the Flames obviously had an intent of keeping him here, I uh, imagine. Actually, he was injured, so they couldn't actually send him down. They just couldn't yeah. send him down? Okay. And I'm a big Horak fan. I personally think that Horak needs more NHL time, and I would I'd take him over uh, Smith. Well, I'd take Breen and Horak at this point over Smith and Jones. I think that's probably a good move. We don't know if it's permanent or for one game or two games, but I think giving those guys some NHL time is probably the right move. Yeah. Well, realistically, the reason why Horak was down and Jones was up to begin with is so that Horak could get some better ice time in the AHL. Yeah, because at the time, like, why are you going to have Horak on the fourth line getting like five or six minutes when you can have him in the AHL getting power play time, penalty kill time, and like 18, 20 minutes? So, you know, I can understand that. Obviously, the. Uh, you know, they're probably going to be playing him in a more significant role, I would assume. You know, I don't think Korak has, like, the high-end skill that would be required to be a top six forward down the road, but he could be a very good third, fourth line guy. And having Breen up, you know, anything that gets Butler out of the lineup is a good thing. Yeah, so if he can... Even without Luke here, we still have to do our butler bash. Yeah. Well, like, even uh, with the Corsi and Fenwick numbers on Butler, like, he's been abysmally bad, even in situations where he shouldn't be. So, yeah, just getting rid of... <laughs> you know, like, that's one of those players that, like, it would actually be an improvement to the team removing him off the ice permanently for how bad he's been playing. So, you know, it, he has to step up quite a bit. Otherwise, I don't think Butler's going to have an NHL job for very much longer, if at all. So you think this is a message to Butler? I mean, we have seven defensemen on the roster, but do you think Breen's being called up to let Butler sit for a couple games and yeah. see if he can change his, his game and his attitude? Yeah, well, like, O'Brien hasn't looked that bad all things considered. And Breen's more of a tougher customer like O'Brien. So having two tougher guys on the ice wouldn't be a necessarily bad idea. But, you know, like having Butler making a lot of mental mistakes. Like, there's been like seven or eight plays that this year alone that I can recall off the top of my head where he had more than enough time to just stop with like where he had the puck he could just stop survey the scene and make the appropriate pass but instead he rushes the play and turnovers are created and the puck magically goes in the net or they get a good scoring chance like you need to be able to slow the game down a bit especially when you're not being immediately pressured and you know, like, there was one goal where, like, he had the puck at the blue line, and he could have just passed it, like, five feet in front of him to the forward there, but instead he tried to cross the ice pass, and it was picked off, and the guy, like, it created a two-on-one, and they scored. It, you know, like, you don't need to have defensemen that, like, willfully sabotage you. <laughs> you know, like, it's... Yeah, he needs to stop up. Defenseman forward or goalie, anyone that's willingly sabotaging you should end up spending some time out time in the press yeah, box. Yeah, it's like back when Anders Eriksson played for the Flames, like and like all Flames fans were would be screaming, "God damn it, Anders!" <laughs> Every game, practically. I forgot that guy played here. Wow, yeah, that guy was awful. I remember. Yeah, you know, like you could pretty much instruct him as a coach to go defend the other team's goalie, and he'd do such a good job that he'd probably score more. <laughs> you know. Maybe you'd be able to trade him after that. 
God, he was bad. <laughs> but, you know, it's nice to have that kind of depth and to have management and coaching have that kind of confidence in a guy like Breen to say, okay, one of our NHL regulars, and I don't think anyone probably thought realistically that Breen would not be an NHL regular on this team this year, isn't playing the way we want him to. So let's bring up a, a guy like uh, Breen. Sorry, I don't think anyone thought that Butler would not be an NHL regular this year. So let's bring up a guy like Breen to spell him off. And I think having that kind of farm depth, or at least having that kind of confidence in the farm depth, is a huge boon for this yeah. team. Yeah, and the thing is, is that like Breen's like 24, 25 now, and he has to get a shot in the NHL to see whether or not he's going to be an NHL defenseman. You know, like you have to see what you've got. And... You know, you've got other guys like Billens, Watherspoon, and Sealoff and Kandari that are all talented, and they'll be needing shots in the NHL to prove that they're NHL players or not. So, you know, if a player like Butler is struggling so badly, then, you know... It, you have to pretty much go through the four guys, five guys that you have on the farm that are credible players and see what they've got. Because you don't know if Breen might actually develop into a credible 5-6 guy that you can rely on for the next handful of years, like an Adam Party, but tougher. You know, like you just don't know. And that's the whole thing with the rebuild is that all these guys are unproven, so they need the actual ice time in order to determine what they are. And, you know, if you got veteran players that are struggling, then give the kids a shot. You know, and if the kids struggle, then get other kids in there and see what they've got. Get a di Yeah, get a different kid in there. Like you said, we have quite a range of uh, defensemen between Seeloff, Witherspoon, Kandari, Breen. That if one of them's not working, we'll we'll get another one, and it's not going to be like, oh, we've you know gone way down the farm depth. This guy's no good. There's a lot of guys knocking on the door, and I think as the Abbotsford season goes on, and we start to see some of these young players playing well in Abbotsford, we're going to see more and more that if you're not performing at the NHL level, you're going to end up sitting and someone else is going to get a shot at your expense. Yeah, and with Abbotsford, like, there are about a dozen players that are players that if they were put in the NHL, like, they wouldn't be a, very much out of place. Like, some of them might be a little bit behind the play just because they have to adjust, but, like, you know, we, we actually have depth for a change. You know, whether it's guys like Reinhardt, Knight... Granlin, you know, like, I can go through the whole list, and, like, you know, if you're not playing the right way on the pro team, then, you know, you have to always be looking back at who's going to be looking at taking your job, you know, and it's good. Competition's always good. Well, and I think because we because we have that many guys who are knocking on the door of the NHL, it also opens up the possibility for the Flames to move some of them. If we say, you know what, this guy's knocking on the door, but we have somebody we like better, or this guy's knocking on the door and other teams see it, it might give us a chance to move some of those guys. Someone like, say, a Breen, who is 24, and if the Flames say, you know what, he's good, but we want to go with somebody different, um, get some for it. You know, get another draft pick or a prospect, but I think having that deep covered, we don't think about it in a rebuild year, but having that deep covered gives us a chance to trade for draft picks and, you know, start the cycle again or trade for other young players who we might yeah. like as well. Well, it's like if you have like seven or eight centers and, you know, you take the three or four better ones, but like the other guys will still be credible players. You can trade some of those guys off for other things that you need, whether... Well, like, if you look at, like, L.A., for example, uh, they had most of their core good players in there, but, like, they were still lacking some higher-end players, and so they sent Shannon Simmons off to Philadelphia to get Mike Richards and, you know, Jack Johnson for Carter, you know, and yet, like, they were able to credibly replace each of the players that they traded with other guys, you know, as well as improving the overall talent in their team. So, like, down the road, that's the kind of thing that 
might have to occur, you know, like the better depth that you have, the more options you have in order to address the needs that you have at the time. So, yeah. Well, that's it. We won't be able to keep this AHL roster that we have right now, all those guys in the AHL in the long term. I mean, when contracts get renewed, they'd probably want to walk for mm-hmm. an AHL job. But, yeah, if the, if the option comes this year to, say, move somebody from that group for a decent player or as part of a bundle, I think that's one thing that we don't necessarily look at in a rebuild, but we definitely have to think as possible of, you know what, the Flames could easily go through and uh, trade some of these young players for either other young players or uh, prospects or even draft picks. And I think ever since Feaster's come along, we've done a better job of actually identifying young players to bring into this organization that have been successful in their Mm -hmm. time here. And, like, you just have to look at the depth of the forward talent. And, you know, like, there's, like, seven or eight names that, like, they all have legit top six potential, like Monaghan, Berchi, Poirier, Klimchuk, Jankowski, Goudreau, you know, like, you, it's not possible to have every single one of those guys on your top six. So, like, that creates other problems down the road, like, how do you allocate ice time to each of these players if they actually do turn up. But, you know, that's a good problem to have down the road. (laughs) It is. I'd rather have a lot of those guys around here all fighting for, say, two or three spots, and then we can make the moves accordingly down the road. But I'd rather have almost too much young talent fighting for those spots than not have enough and be in a position like Edmonton in their rebuild where they're constantly having to bring in new pieces. Well, usually, like, a team that's in a rebuild, in order to become a contending team, you need, like, 15 to 20 prospects that are of the Jankowski, Berchi level, whether it's forwards, defensemen, or goaltenders, in order to get enough, you know, because, like, even amongst the good prospects, the cream will rise to the top. So, you know, like, say, like, Berchi, if he's okay and like a 50 60 point guy but you're needing a 70 point guy well maybe you can package him up with somebody else type of thing for that 70 point guy down the road but you know that's another whole (laughs) you know thing down the road i was gonna say that's almost another whole episode for perhaps the off season is starting to speculate on what this team might look like three four five years down the road It's definitely a lot more interesting this year with what might come instead of will they actually make the playoffs this time? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's also exciting this year because we're seeing, even though the Flames are a rebuilding team, and let's face it, a team that's not that great. I mean, they've had some luck so far, um, but they're trying hard and they're playing an interesting game that fans here in Calgary still want to see, I think. We're I mean, you're a season ticket holder. Are you noticing more seats empty? I think people still want to see this I, team. I haven't really noticed any difference in the empty seats. Like, I know towards the end of last year, like, especially after Ginla was traded, that, like, everybody kind of vanished. But, you know, that would be expected. But this year, like, it, well, even, like, when Windsport, they had the prospects camp there, like... It, You know, like, it was a packed house every day. And, you know, especially with the scrimmages, like, they were lined up around the rink. You know, so, you know, like, the enjoyment and, like, what do we have, you know, it's more of an inspirational story type of thing instead of, oh, maybe this year, you know, we might actually make the playoffs if, you know, the stars align in just the right yeah, manner. I've said this before, but I think management management has set different expectations this year. For the last couple of years, management keeps saying we're a playoff team, we're a playoff team, and they set that expectation. The issue your management sent the expectation, don't expect much, we're rebuilding. And so I think that fans came in with little expectations are now being surprised. And I mean, I'm even seeing people that aren't Flames fans or don't classify themselves much of Flames fans talking about the team this year because they are so exciting. And to me, that's how we know that this team has, I guess, captured the hearts of Calgarians. Yeah. Well, like, 
the other team. It reminds me of the 04 team in that way. It's a it's a bunch of guys that nobody wanted. It's kind of the NHL's cast offs. And they're the, I mean, I don't want to say that they're going to make the playoffs or even make a run for the cup, but they're that little team that could so yeah. far. Well, like, it, it, at the New Jersey game in the third period, like uh, Lance Bulma, he made a couple of nice block shots and he, he got a standing ovation from the crowd. You know, like, the fans are enjoying the effort that they're putting. Like the the level of cheering in that at the end of that game was probably the loudest I've heard the Dome in like three or four years. So, you know, like the good effort, you know, like the fans recognize that, okay, yeah, we might not have all this awesome talent, but like they can see clearly that these players are actually giving a damn and giving it their all and, you know, trying a hundred percent, not, you know, just relying on their talent. So, yeah. And really, that's all we can ask for, right? In a year where we are rebuilding, in a year we know we're probably not going to be a great team, let's admit it and get it out there, I think that's all we can ask for is 100% effort yeah. every shift. Well, like, how would you say? Like, it's hard to complain about uh, how the players are playing when they're doing all the little things right. It's just they don't have necessarily have enough talent to actually be a playoff team but you know like they're forechecking properly they're skating hard you know they're making nice plays so you know it's encouraging instead of you know like ifs and maybes <laughs> yeah and that's you know and that's what we need to see is guys that we know are NHL caliber because they can play hard and stay at the NHL level instead of just guys that, oh, this is what we got, we'll play with it, and when it's time to finish the rebuild or get out of it, we got to get rid of them all because they're just not at the caliber mm -hmm. we need. Definitely encouraging. This, is, this year, I think, is going to be a real test to see who deserves to stick around through the rebuild and who perhaps either we trade or we let go or gets relegated to the AHL for a couple of mm -hmm. years. Well, that's, you know, this season, if you view it in the prism of it being an extended training camp where, like, all the jobs are up for grabs for next year and the year after, then it's a lot better because, like, you're getting to see all the little things, you know, instead of, you know, focusing on the results of, oh, we lost 6-3, you know. Like, oh, they suck because of that. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's yeah. more about individuals. Well, even being the best team in the league, I don't care who you are, everybody loses. You know, so we've, the Flames have lost two in a row. I mean, even the best teams in the league lose two in a row from time to time. We're just going to have to weather, weather the storm and go from here and see how this season plays itself out. But I think either way, it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. We should probably let fans know about an interesting event that's happening this weekend uh, for Flames season ticket holders. It's, I believe this is the first annual Flames Fan Fest, is that correct? I'm not sure, but I think so. Okay, well, there's a event called the Flames Fan Fest happening this Sunday. That would be uh, Sunday, October 27th at the Dome. You have to be a season ticket holder to get in. And there's all sorts of things going on at the Dome, but the biggest event I think that's going to be happening is the third jersey for the Flames this season will finally be unveiled. And that's really what they're touting. Um, the three of us, me, Matt, and Luke, will all be at the uh, event. We will all be in the presence when the jersey is revealed, so we're going to hope to cover that and give you guys some uh, reactions right from the Dome when we see the new jersey. Yeah. Matt, we talked about the leak last week. Um, do you think that's probably what we're going to see? Yeah. Do you think that they're going to give us something completely different? What do you think for this jersey? Well, on the Jumbotron in a couple of the home games, they did show like little spoilers like we've seen with other teams releasing their jerseys. And the leak seems to be accurate entirely. But, you know, like, especially the shoulder patch, like, that was evidently, you know, apparent there. So, likely what you've seen in that aesthetics 
EA game release online that, you know, that, that's likely what we're going to be seeing on Sunday. What we're yeah. probably going to end up seeing. Yeah, well, and, you know, the shoulder patch thing, I was actually going back and looking back through some old notes I had for the Flames. And if you remember when the current jersey was released, the Flames said that they were working on a new shoulder patch and the flags were just supposed to be a placeholder for one season. Yeah. And they've stayed there for, what, four or five years now? So it doesn't surprise me that there's a new shoulder patch being debuted. But I'm really hoping that the jersey's not the one that we saw in aesthetics because I really didn't like that jersey at all. Well, how would you say that jersey from there, there are elements that I liked with it and others that, yeah, like if you could just tweak certain things, like it would have looked a lot better. But if that's what it is, then, you know, it's not going to be the worst third jersey ever. So, you know, it'll do for the time being. It wouldn't be the worst one ever, but would it be the worst one in franchise history? No, the horse head still gets that. So even if even if it ends up being what we think it's going to be, it won't even be the worst one in in franchise history. Yeah. So I don't know. I it depends what the script looks like. The scripted word Calgary on the front. I think that to me is going to depend if it's worse or better than the horse head. Yeah. Because they could do that well, or they could do that really poorly. It just depends, and. Um... You know, like, it, that jersey, if it is that one, like, if they just take the script off and, like, put the black flaming C, like, that actually look very sharp as a jersey. So, you know, like, most of the elements are good. It's just, you know, the details. <laughs> My biggest issues with the scripted word Calgary, you're right, if they took that off and they put a C on it, either black or or went with kind of the retro look and put a white one back on there, which we haven't seen in years, I think the jersey would be okay. But uh, my biggest issue is with the scripted word Calgary on the front. Well, it, we'll see. <laughs> There's actually a mock-up that I saw um, that a graphic designer I know ended up putting out, and he would he actually took the A out of Calgary and put the horse head in there too. He said, if we're going to make this thing ugly... We might as well just go all the way. Yeah, not a bad idea. <laughs> uh, well. So um, the the Calgary Flames are currently playing the LA Kings as we speak, and Camilleri is in the lineup. Horak and Breen are both scratched tonight. Okay. Well, I have the game PVR'd, so I'm going to wait till it's finished to watch it. So don't tell the scores if you know. <laughs> I won't tell the scores. I'm just letting you know that based on what we were talking about, Cammy's in, and uh, Horak and Breen are both out tonight. Yeah. So. Well, it's one of those things that if guys like Butler have a poor performance tonight, they might be sitting tomorrow. So just got to wait and see. And maybe he feels that pressure now. If there's somebody here who's ready to spell me off. Yeah. This is my last chance. Mm -hmm. And that pressure can definitely be a motivating factor to play better. So it just depends. You know, you have to evaluate on how they play. And, you know, like you can go in with a certain f framework of expectations, but, you know, it's up to them to either exceed them or meet them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, one game at a time, too. I think we got to evaluate each player based on their last one, maybe two games, and especially this early in the season. I mean, the whole body of work has to speak for them, but you got to look at the most recent uh, play because if they're playing really awful, let's just sit them for a game or two and bring somebody else up. I don't think you can say, well, so-and-so has played well for seven games and then had two or three bad ones. Sit them down, give them some rest, get somebody else in for one or two games, and then put the original guy back in the lineup. Yeah, definitely. Well, Matt, let's send this thing home. If people want to follow you, you're normally live tweeting during the away games or talking hockey most of the week. Where can they find you? Uh, on, on Twitter at Caged Great. And if you're going to follow Lucas, he's at Luke1701. So. 1701, just like the Starship Enterprise. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. Well, I'm sure that uh, Luke wishes that he had the name Jean somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah, probably. Jean Luke 1701. One can change their Twitter handle. We should see if it's available for Probably him. not. Too many Trekkies out there. <laughs> That's true. That's true. There are a lot of Trekkies. If people want to follow me, I don't talk a lot of hockey. Some hockey. Um, I'm at DG Stevenson, and it's probably best to go to our website, firesidechat.ca. You'll see me, Matt, and Lucas's uh, Twitter links across the side in the sidebar. You'll also find on our website all the latest episodes, um, great articles that Matt writes, puts on the website outside of the podcast content. So if you want more Flames news than you get through our weekly show, you can definitely go there and check that out. Um, you can also subscribe to our show via RSS on the website through iTunes, or now we're available on Stitcher as well if you're a Stitcher user. And make sure to follow the show either at Fireside Podcast on Twitter or Facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. Anything else before we get out of here, Matt? No, just go Flames go, and hopefully they have a good week this week. There's four games, so, you know. It's a a busy week for them this week, so let's hope they can at least break even, I think. Yeah, well, as long as they give a good effort in each game, that's the important thing. Like, even if they go 0-4, but they give them hell, it's all good. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's very similar to what our minor minor hockey coaches used to tell us, right? It doesn't matter what the score is as long as you tried hard and had fun. No expectations. Just go out there and do your best. (laughs) And we'll be back next week with our third jersey reactions after we see the thing live and talk about what happened this week. Take care, everyone. Talk to you later, Take care. Oh, we are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We We know you're rooting for for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. (laughs)